to worship God in spirit and truth. For we recognize that our God is worthy uh, to be praised. Uh, God ought not have to beg us to praise him. Uh, he's simply worthy. And to that end, we have come into this place that we will direct our attentions to the goodness and the mercy of Almighty God. Yes, it's certainly good to be here at the Heights, and it is always uh, a pleasure to come, uh, first and foremost, to be with my mentor and to have uh, just a moment to speak with him and to, uh, and, to, um, and to be blessed with some advice about life and just to be in his presence is always um, a pleasure and grateful for uh, the deposit that he made in my life in regards to ministry and the preaching of the word of God. Uh, I can say without any fear of successful contradiction that he, uh, without question, is the greatest mentor that any preacher could ever have. And I'm just always thankful that this church takes one month to celebrate him and to let him know how much he is appreciated within this local context, although we recognize he is appreciated across this brotherhood. And so we're just grateful to God for him and for what he means to us. Many of us uh, did not know how to spell preach until he told us how to spell it. And so we're just grateful to him for all of his deposits. He's been a great defender throughout the years and has been an example of what it means to be an apologetic preacher. And apologetic doesn't mean say sorry. It means to set a defense for the Christian faith. And I'm grateful for uh, many times when I go across this brotherhood and people say we appreciate uh, your stance in defending the gospel, where well, I know I got that from this place. And uh, with all uh, of the academic stuff I may have done, there was no education greater than the education I received here at the Golden Heights Church of Christ. It's good to see Mama, as always, and um, uh, she is synonymous with neck bones and good food. Uh, so every time I see her, that's that that feeling just comes all over me praise jesus and i just just good to see mama she always maintains uh being absolutely beautiful and we just grateful to god for her i bring you greetings from my family uh sony uh, nehemiah and nevaeh uh everyone is doing absolutely well and every time i come they wish they could be here the grandkids get upset when i say i'm going to fort lauderdale uh, and uh, Nehemiah says, where are you going? I say, I'm going to Florida. Without me? And I say, yes, yeah, son, it's just going to be me on this trip. But he, every time this time of year, Nevaeh and Nehemiah wish they could be here. They're doing great, and we just thank God for that. If you would, uh, turn with me to Luke, uh, the 19th chapter, and verse 10, and then I'm going to invite you to um, Psalms, the 8th chapter. And we'll read both contexts. I won't be long. I'm uh, back home. I'm learning how to preach uh, uh, within a decent amount of time. I also long learned how to be long here at the Golden Heights Church of Christ. My sermonic elongated presentations were earned honestly. Uh, but that's because I remember Pop saying in a sermon, he says, it takes time to unfold the word of God. And, and he used Acts 2. It says, now when they heard this, Pop said, I don't know how long he preached, but it takes time for folk to hear the word of God and to get a, a healthy dose of what it means. So we just appreciate that. Uh, Luke 19 and verse number 10. It's a familiar verse. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save uh, that which was lost. I want you to uh, focus your attention on the phrase son of man, son of man. Uh, now turn to Psalms 8 Psalms the 8th chapter Psalms the 8th chapter and if you don't mind I'd like to read uh, this whole chapter right. oh lord our lord how majestic 
is your name in all the earth. I've heard Pops quote that more, uh, many years, and I didn't even know where it was, but I used to hear him say, Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Who has displayed your splendor above the heavens? From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries. To make the enemy and the revengeful cease. When I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man? that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him. Yet you made him a little lower than the angels and you crowned him with glory and majesty. You make him the rule over all the works of your hands and you have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the fields, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes through the paths of the seas, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. I want to uh, lift for a subject just for a few moments. Thank God I got it back. Uh, thank God I got it back. I want to suggest to you that um, when we begin to look at the scheme of redemption, I believe the Bible is a redemptive book. At the end of the day, when we look at the Bible and the corpus of all of its writings, while it is historical, while it is true that it is theological, while it is true that it is scientific or it at least lines up with true science, while all of those things are true, at the end of the day, the Bible is a redemptive book. That means that uh, what God is unfolding from beginning to end is what we call the scheme of redemption. That is, the Bible must be read recognizing that God is unfolding his scheme in Romans 8, I think, is the greatest synopsis of what the Bible is doing and what God is doing. In Romans 8, it says, For whom he did foreknow, he did predestine to be conformed to the image of his dear son. And them that he predestined, them he called, and those he called, those he justified, and those that he justified, them he will also glorify. That is what God is doing. That is God's purpose. That is his eternal purpose purpose and that is what the Bible is unfolding so when you read the Bible we read it as a dissertation on the scheme of redemption now within the scheme of redemption I don't have to tell you Jesus Christ is the centerpiece everything happens and is centered on the work of Christ Jesus and I want to suggest to you that one aspect of his work that needs to be appreciated is found in one of his messianic titles. And that messianic title is that Jesus is not only the son of God, he is also the son of man. I want to take that uh, phrase and look at it uh, in what it means in regards to how Jesus works on our behalf in bringing about our salvation. Christ, uh, without question, we can appreciate that he is the son of God. I don't know if there is a gospel writer that does more with the sonship of Jesus than the apostle John. John sees Jesus as God's only begotten son. And the word begotten means he's the only one of his kind. Jesus is the son of God, which is but to suggest he has the same nature as his father. But he is also the son of man and I want to look at how being the son of man factors into our salvation Luke 19 uh, the verse suggests uh, that uh, Jesus says I have come the son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost and I want to look at how Jesus 
refers to himself in that text as the son of man that has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He doesn't say the son of God has come to seek and to save that which is lost, but he refers to himself in this text as the son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. I need to know what does the son of man have to do with rescuing me from my lostness? Are y'all following what I'm saying? And I just want to look at that uh, for a few moments. Now, if you turn your Bible quickly to Psalms 8, uh, Psalms the 8th chapter, the book of Psalms is celebrated in at least five books. Uh, and it has a plethora of different authors, although David is his primary authorship. There are more Psalms written by David than anyone else. However, there are other authors of the book of Psalms. And this poetic uh, genre is celebrated into five books. We're going to look at the first book, Psalms, the eighth chapter, is within the first section of the book of Psalms. And look at this poetic literature as it impresses our minds about how God cares about us. Right. This is a Davidic Psalm. And look at what, uh, what David says. David says... Oh Lord, our Lord, uh, how excellent uh, is your reputation or name in all of the earth. Yeah. Who has sent glory above the heavens. There's some good preaching and just how excellent is God's reputation. Uh, I thank God uh, his name, his character is so excellent. Uh, that anybody ought to be able to praise God for the excellency of who he is. But look at the text. Look at verse number 2 uh, in Psalms 8. Look at verse number 2. He says, Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies. Thou, thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Watch verse 3. Verse 3 says, When I consider, please watch the question, the work that your heavens and the works of your fingers the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. Look at verse 4. He says, What is man within the fabric of your created order? What is man that you are mindful of him or has visited him or the son of man that thou hast visited him? Look, now he uses man and son of man in what we would call our parallelism in the book of Psalms. Parallelism means he says the same thing in different words. So in the first part of the text he says, what is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou art visiting, visited him? In other words, man and son of man are being used interchangeably. So when we're talking about the son of man, we are talking about the one or the persons who have human nature. Are y'all following that? All right, man and the son of man are parallel and it indicates that one is of human nature. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Now, now in other words, when I look at your stars, and I looked at your moon, and I looked at your created order, David said, I'm trying to figure out what makes me so important. Yeah. Are you following that? All right, now, I think anybody could sympathize with that. When you look at all that God has created, and you look at the cosmic reality of all that God has created with his fingers, and I look at this, cosmo, uh, this, this cosmic reality, situation in within the tapestry of all that God created what is man what is are you following that all right now watch this uh, next verse says yet you made him a little lower all right when I looked at creation and I looked at everything God made within the tapestry of this cosmic order David said I need you to help me, God, understand what in that cosmic order is man. Why do you care so much for him? But you loved him and cared so much. This is actually a positive statement. You made him right under the angels. 
Now, he's not, this, is not a, this is not a demotion kind of statement. He's showing that as a man, I'm made right under the angelic order. Now, I, I don't have time to talk much about what an angel is, except that an angel is an extremely powerful being. Uh, and God made us a little lower than the angels. Now, but then there's something God did for me that he did not do for an angel. Look at your text. Look at the next verse. He's, for that, that, that was made him a little lower than angels. Uh, thou, or let's go back. Go back to verse 5. Go back to verse 5. Go, for thou has made him a little lower than the angels. Now, here's what he didn't do for an angel. You crowned him with glory and with honor. Now, hold this in your pocket because I'm about to show you you lost something that Jesus had to give you back. When God made man, he crowned him with honor and with glory. All right, now watch the next verse, verse 6. Watch what all that God did. You made him to have dominion over the works of your hand. Now, David is looking back to when man was originally created. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When God created man, yeah. he created him a little lower than the angels, but then watch what he did that he didn't do for an angel. He gave man dominion, yeah. crowning him with honor and with glory. Now, let me help you. That has everything to do with being made in the image of God. The way I'm made in God's image, one of the ways in which I am made in God's image is I am the only of God's created order that God made me to have dominion which resembles who he is in heaven. God gives man dominion that which he has given to no other creature. Part of my glory and my honor is that I function in the position of dominion. That is, when man was first created and when he put man in the garden, you need to be real clear that Adam had dominion, glory, and honor because he was made in God's image. Uh, now stay with me here because, because if you don't understand that if you don't get this you're not going to know what you lost salvation is not just about forgiveness of sin it's about restoring man back to how he was created are you following? alright watch this he says you made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands thou hast put all things under his feet watch the next verse uh, he's praising God, of course. He's, he's praising God here. All sheep, all oxen, yea, the beasts of the field. Next verse says what? All the sheep, all the oxen, the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatever passed through the paths of the sea, all things were put under man's feet. And here's how David ends. When David looks at how man was created, he says, Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. However, David is looking at how man was originally created. But when sin entered the garden, man, although God's image, lost his dominion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Everything was under his feet. He had dominion, he was crowned with glory and honor, which is but to say man was created for rulership. He's in God's image. But when man sinned, the devil introducing disobedience caused man to lose his position of dominance. Are you up now? That means when sin, sin robbed me of not only a relationship with God, it robbed me of my glory. When God made me, he made me to have glory. And my glory is tied to my dominion. When sin entered into the garden, I lost all that. 
What I lost was dominion. What I lost was my glory. What I lost was my honor. Watch this. So man is now walking around the earth in the image of God, but he doesn't have what goes with his image. Yeah. I'm the image of God, but what goes with my image is dominion. And now I'm walking around in God's image, but I don't have the functionality of my image. The functionality of my image is that I function as one who rules and has dominion now. The question is, if that's what I lost and I'm walking around in God's image, but I ain't got no glory. I ain't got no dominion. What God puts in place in his scheme of redemption is how to bring you back to the glory that he gave you when he first created you. Are you following what I'm saying? When I look at salvation, I see salvation as so much larger than just the forgiveness of my sin. It's the forgiveness of my sin, but you need to be mindful of everything you lost because of your sin. All right? Now, God wants to rescue man to the degree that he wants to rescue back his glory. Let me help you. When an angel sinned, there was no plan of salvation. So when an angel sins, God does not put in place a redemptive process to bring an angel back. But he loved me enough that when he made me in his image and his resemblance, God said, I love you so much and you are so much a representation of me that I want to bring you back to the thing you lost. You are in my image, but you're not functioning as if you have the image. Are you following that? Because in order to function in God's image, you got to function in dominion. Are you following? Oh, I, I need to get back what I lost so that God can bring me back to my glory. How does God bring me back to my glory? God becomes a man so that he can rescue man and bring him back to glory. Yeah. Now, now, God's got to come down and become who I am in order to bring me back to the dominion I first had. Yeah. Because man cannot get back to God unless God comes down to man. And when God comes down to man, he will become a man so that he can rescue man and bring him back to his original dominion. Oh, yeah. All right, let, let, turn to Hebrews 2. <laughs> turn to Hebrews 2. Hebrews chapter 2. I, I, I'm almost done. Hebrews the second chapter. Look at Hebrews 2 uh, and verse 5. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 5. Uh, because if you don't appreciate salvation... Well, you cannot appreciate salvation until you know what you lost. And there's a lot of folk that don't know what they lost. If you knew what you lost, you'd want to get it back. And it's only through God that I get back everything that I lost. And one of the things I lost was my glory and my dominion. Yeah. All right, now watch Hebrews 2. Here it is. Hebrews, the second chapter and verse number five. He says, for he did not subject to angels the world to come concerning which we also speak. In other words, the world to come here, he's using flamboyant language to describe uh, the God scheme of redemption and bringing man back to his state of glory. He did not subject to angels the world to come, concerning which we now are speaking, but one has testified somewhere saying, here it is, he quotes, the Hebrew writer says, get for me, Psalms chapter 8. And he says, but one is testified somewhere saying, what is man that you remember him? Please watch this. Or the son of man that you are concerned about him. You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. All he's doing is quoting Psalms 8. You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and have appointed him over the works of your hands you have put all things in subjection under his feet for in subjecting all things to him he left nothing that is not subject to him but we do not yet see all things subject to him wait a minute if if, you, if god is saying i made man to have dominion the hebrew writer is saying i made man to have dominion 
I made him to have glory. I'm quoting Psalms 8 to show you how God made man. But here's the problem. We don't see all things under him. He lost his dominion because there's now some stuff that's not under his feet. When he was in the garden, everything was under his feet. He had dominion. He had glory. He had honor. But the Hebrew writer quotes Psalms 8 to show how man was originally created. But then he says, problem, we don't see everything under him. Okay, come here. Y'all see the problem? All right. We, we don't see under everything under him, but watch verse 9. But we see Jesus. Uh, all right, come here. We don't see all things under his feet. That's man. But we see Jesus. He's lost everything he had. And in the garden was created to have rule and dominion. What, how am I going to get back everything I lost? But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. And Jesus was crowned with glory and with honor that he by the grace of God should taste death forever. Wait a minute. All right, come here. He looked, man lost everything. God sends Jesus. Jesus becomes man. And when he becomes man, he gets back for man what he lost. Jesus becoming a man gets crowned with glory and with honor. The very thing I lost because of sin. Come here. But the way Jesus gets it back, he gets it back by becoming a man. Y'all not getting it. He, he gets it back by becoming me and on behalf of me gets back what I lost because I couldn't get it back for myself. So God sent Jesus. Jesus being God becomes a man and rescues back everything that I lost. And when we see Jesus now, we see him crowned with glory and with honor. Now let me see what his ministry is. All right, with glory and honor that he might, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Next verse. Look at verse 10. Here, here's, here, here's the shout. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. What are you doing, Jesus? I'm bringing many sons. <laughs> I, I lost glory. I lost honor. I lost dominion. Christ becomes a man and gets back for me what I lost. Now the ministry of Jesus is that he's bringing many sons back to the glory that they lost when they were in the garden. Are y'all following this? What are you doing, Jesus? As the son of man, as a man, I'm about to say something that's going to make you think about it. As the son of man, as a man, Jesus gets back for man what man lost, which was his dominion. Watch this. He dies as a man. He resurrects on Sunday morning as a man. Ah, he meets with his disciples as a man. Then Jesus steps on a cloud to go back to glory as a man in a glorified state so that when you see Jesus on the right hand of God you're not just seeing the son of God you are seeing the son of man who has now been exalted back to the place of dominion Christ on my behalf is now ruling in heaven as a man that got back glory and dominion. So when I look to heaven now, I think I read where Stephen, well, let's read it, let's read it. Get Acts 7, look at Acts 7, verse number 53. Acts 7, verse 53. This is where it, it becomes amazing to me yeah. what God has done. Because what God did was he gives me back glory that I lost. Look at Acts 7. 
and verse well I tell you what let's look at verse number 55 but being full of the Holy Spirit he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand and he said behold I see the heavens open and what he sees is the y'all not gonna help me along it what he's it doesn't say he saw the son of God he is the son of God but what he sees is a man in heaven at the right hand of God because Christ got back my dominion my glory and my honor on my behalf y'all are missing this thing I guess look Jesus all right Jesus is the first man in heaven I said the first man in heaven is Jesus in glorified state and everything Jesus became the Bible calls him the first fruits which means whatever Christ got that is what's coming for me Christ got up from the grave I'm getting up from the grave Christ got glory and honor I'm going to get glory and honor because he is the first man in heaven and now watch this you, you, now I'm going to really make you shout it is where I might run around the building and I might jump on that pew watch, watch this you needed a man in heaven because only a man could plead your case no, okay, come here. You, you need it. You, you need somebody in heaven that understands the full scope of your temptation. God, in his state, does not experience the full pressure of your temptation. But if you can get a man up there that is able to understand the full scope of my temptation, and can sympathize with when I have a problem. I need somebody that can be touched with the feeling of my infirmity, yet be without sin. I thank Christ Jesus that he's the son of man sitting on the right hand of... There's a verse we quote all the time. In 1 Timothy 2.5, there is one mediator between God and man don't read it too fast it says the man I'm going to say it again there's one mediator between God and man well who's mediating for me the man not, not the son of God he's the son of God but when he's mediating for me, he mediates as a man. Y'all are, oh God, boy, man. Oh, the son of, I know he's the son of God, but sometimes in emphasizing his divinity, we ignored his humanity. And I needed his humanity in order to get me some grace. The only way I get grace is because I come to the throne of grace on the basis of the man's ministry. All right, one more verse. I'm closing. He Hebrews, Hebrews 4, 15. Hebrews 4, 15. I'm closing. Now, you know, this, this can make you feel a way because sometimes we don't want to consider that a man is in heaven. But be mindful, I said, it's a man in glorified state. Every, nobody gets to heaven until their body is changed in the twinkling of an eye. When Christ raises from the dead and ascends back to God, he ascends back, but he receives a glorious body. Are y'all following what I'm saying? Now, well... There's two more verses. I said one more, but we have not a high priest. Here it is, sir. 
which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity, but was in all points. All right, James 1 says, God cannot be tempted. But Jesus was tempted. God cannot be tempted with evil. But Jesus could be tempted to sin. The only reason Jesus could be tempted to sin is because he took on the form of a man that's vulnerable to sin, but thank God he was yet without sin. Now watch the text. Watch verse 16. Look at verse 16. Look at verse 16. Let us, uh, uh, therefore, now, uh, Pop used to say, what is therefore, therefore? What is therefore, therefore? Based on Christ's humanity. Based on the fact that he could be tempted in all points. On that basis, let us come boldly. Uh, you see? You ain't got no business coming boldly until Jesus postured himself as a mediating man. And now that Jesus is my mediating man, he was tempted in all points. I now can come to God boldly. Watch this. Unto the throne of God, of throne of grace, that we may obtain now let me tell you what this is. This ain't get help before you sin. This is you need help after you sin. It, you need mercy when you have failed. But you need somebody to understand the full pressure of what that sin feels like. Jesus based on humanity, allows you to come to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help. I wish I had two or three folk that can admit that with this sin struggle of ours, somebody needs some help, somebody needs some mercy, somebody needs some grace, but the Son of Man is in heaven, having been tempted in all points, and based on his ministry, I can come to the throne of grace Holy. Not based on divinity, but based on his humanity. Are y'all following this? Now, now let me prove that he got, it. he got it all back for you. Look at Daniel 7. Daniel 7. I should have said this early. Da Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14, and I'm done. Da Daniel 7, a prophetic picture of Jesus. Daniel 7, verse 13. And we read it to get the kingdom, because the kingdom is in here. But I need you to also see that there's a rescue plan in here. That the, the one who got exalted to have a kingdom was a man. <laughs> I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, God, and they brought him near before him. Watch the next verse. Watch what this man was given. And see, you should have shouted already as soon as you started reading. Look, look, at what, look at what the Son of Man was given. And there was given him. Isn't that what you lost? There was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and language should serve him. Christ, in addition to establishing the kingdom, represents man. And man through Jesus returns back to his exalted state. Are you seeing that? Now, now if you're here uh, this morning, I don't know much about football. But they tell me in football, sometimes a person fumbles. And they tell me when that fumble happens, Sometimes the players can run to try to recover the ball. 
because somebody fumbled. Last time I, I checked, in football, if you fumbled, you made a mistake. You fumbled the ball. But somebody's got to recover it. What I want to suggest to you is that in the garden, Adam fumbled the ball. And ever since then, somebody's been trying to recover the ball. Abraham couldn't recover it. David could not recover it. Isaac could not recover it. Jacob could not recover it. But thank God the Son of Man came and he recovered what we fumbled. And now he is in heaven. I'm done. On the right hand of God as a man. So when I start praying, and I know I messed up, ain't no question, did you mess up? You messed up? We ain't got to come in church and act overly sanctified. Some of us mess up, and you don't live all that good that you are dependent on your own righteousness. Sometimes I messed up, but then Jesus, when I pray. My prayer goes up. God hears it and looks at Jesus and says, what do you think? Jesus said, well, when I was there, I know what sin feels like. I felt the full pressure of all of that temptation. I know that he needs some forgiveness because I know what that pressure feels like. Give him mercy. Christ, please. If I had time, I'm done. I got to end here. God, God gave me Jesus to intercede. But he also gave me the Holy Spirit. And they intercede two different ways. Jesus intercedes for my sin. The Holy Spirit intercedes when I'm in my suffering. If I had time to go to Romans 8, when I don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit makes intercession. In the context of my son. Can I show it to you and I'm done? I need help. Just a few brothers and I'm done. Uh, come on up here. If you don't mind, you don't have to read nothing. You come on up here. Uh, praise God. Uh, all right, listen. Brother Hughley, stand on that top step. Just for today, you can be God. <laughs> just, just for today. If you don't mind, do your knees hurt? Can you get on your knees on that bottom step? All right, good. I need you to do me a favor, man. You just stand next to Brother Hughley. All right, just stand there, face me. All right, stay right there. All right, good. Um, I need one more brother. I need, come on, y'all, come up here, stop playing. All right, all right, y'all afraid? Young man, would you come up here for me? Because the, they were scared. Come here. Go stand on the other side of Brother Hughley. This is you at 11 o'clock at night. Nobody's answering the phone. Ain't nobody available. But you in a crisis. And you need some intervention. And for whatever reason, you can't get no help. And you get on your knees to pray. I'm telling you, now, now to, to relate to this, you got to be somebody that's familiar with trouble. Now, if you're not familiar with this, this ain't going to help you now. But I, I'm talking about when you want to show enough crisis and ain't nobody available to help. In fact, even if somebody was available, they couldn't help you know how. I'm talking about that kind of crisis. Are you following what I'm saying? And, and matter of fact, there's some folk that call to check on you. You don't even want to answer the phone. You're afraid of what they might say. And you, you're praying. And you start praying to God. But then as you're praying, you remember you, you got some sin in your life. <laughs> so what God will do is, is while you're praying, you say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. And Jesus, the intercessor, says, God, give him some forgiveness. But then what you really want to pray about was not just the forgiveness of sin, but you in a situation where nobody can help. God will dispatch the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes by your side because he intercedes. 
y'all are not getting this. This intercessor got you forgiveness, but another intercessor can get you help in the time of your trouble. And the Holy Spirit will intercede according to God's will. And then when you get up from your knees, you can say, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. When I finish talking to God, one intercessor forgave me of sin. The other intercessor intercedes with my suffering that when I get up from the ground, I can say all things work together. For good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Because not only do I have the Holy Spirit, I got a man on the other side of God. And if you're here right now, you can have your seats. I don't know who you are, where you are, or what's your situation. But thank God for the Son of Man. Thank God that when I pray, somebody understands me and understands the full pressure of my struggle and I can get some mercy because through him, my glory has been rescued. Yeah, 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 yeah. Somebody here needs to get their glory back. You can get it back. You don't have to sit there with the image of God but have no dominion. You need to benefit from what Jesus did and accept him right now this morning and the way you accept him is by hearing that Jesus died was buried and he rose again the third day yeah, 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 yeah. and when he got up look at the gospel he got up as a man ascended back to God as a man and now that man is ruling in his kingdom as a representative a man you can come and get forgiveness. If you heard that and you believe it, repent of your sins and then make the confession, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God and then we'll baptize you right now for the remission of your sins according to Acts 2.38. And when you are baptized, the Holy Spirit will renew you and you'll be a child of God right now today. If you're here, I want you to come. Let's stand together. Let's stand together because I think somebody's ready to say yes to Jesus. If you need, before you sing, if, if you need prayer. Sometimes we come up here for prayer for formality. Now here's what you don't see. When you come up here to pray, the Holy Spirit is going to make intercession. When we don't know how to pray, I know the King James says what to pray. More accurately, in that original language is, we don't know always how. I know who to pray to. <laughs> I, I, I know who to pray to. I know how to pray. But sometimes I, I'm struggling with, with, my, with my what to pray, not the how. I'm struggling with my what to pray. What do I pray? I know how to pray. But in the original language is, what? Do you, we don't know what to pray. I know how, I know who. Sometimes I don't know what. I know I'm in a struggle, and I know I'm suffering, but God, I don't know what. And that's why the Holy Spirit searches you to find the what you can't find. Get that what, and he does it according to God's will, so that God will give you what you need, and not always what you want. And then you get up off your knees and say, and we know. <laughs> Whatever suffering I'm going through, all things work. For a long time, I struggled with what was the things in that text. If you just go back up a few verses, he says, the suffering of this world is not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to come. And God can navigate all of my suffering and work it out to his eternal purpose. And I need you to trust that right now today. If there's somebody needs to come, we're going to start singing and we're asking you to come. Give your life to Jesus. Sure.